<coughs> well, thank you. That was a very nice, warm introduction. Thank you, Pastor Rene. <coughs> I feel very important. <laughs> I can't wait to hear myself speak. <coughs> Good. Well, I'm just having a little look at you. I haven't been able to see you tucked away in the corner. Now I'm able to look at you. And now I need to look at my watch. That's very important for you to see me doing this. It's nearly ten past twelve. I'm very pleased to hear that you're enjoying the Word and Spirit Bible Study series. Uh, we've just finished uh, completing two more on the book of James and Ephesians. And the reason why I wanted to do this about <coughs> a year ago, I suppose, was because increasingly I was sensing in all my travels throughout the world, and especially in the Pentecostal and Charismatic churches, that although we love the Bible greatly, it is becoming less and less significant in the lives of many Christians. And it's the same in the evangelical world as well. And part of the reason is because we live very busy lives. But another reason is because we are losing sight of the fact that this is a very accessible book. We've begun to feel concerned that, is it believable? Um, is it reliable? Is it authentic? Is it accessible? And these questions have resulted in many of us as Christians not spending time in the Bible as we might have done 20, 30 years ago. I even see it in the lives of students who come to theological colleges where their knowledge of the Bible is less than it was 20, 30 years ago, which worries me as to what is the status of the Bible in the churches where they have spent their lives before coming to college. And that was the stimulus for me to try and uh, expend some time on offering some Bible study series where the emphasis was on discovery, exploration, and transformation as a result of bringing our gifts of curiosity to the text which was always intended for us to encounter God when we read it. Too many Christians think of this as being a, a, a database of dogma or an encyclopedia of theology. It's where we get our doctrines from. That's true. But sometimes we lose sight of the fact that actually this is the place where God intends that we meet him. Not just that we learn information about him, but it's where we come, we bring our lives to this altar of sacrifice and he comes to meet us here and to speak to us here. And when the gospel writers presented their gospels, as I hope you will have discovered with the gospel of Mark, they never intended that they would be simply writing history about aspects of the life of Jesus. They thought that this would be an opportunity for us to encounter Jesus personally at that moment of time. So I'm very pleased to hear that, that you're doing that. Today we're going to spend time looking at the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> I'm always a bit nervous when I focus on one member of the Trinity and not the other members of the Trinity. I fear that they might be a bit offended. I, I don't really fear that. <clears throat> But we're going to focus on the Spirit rather than Jesus, rather than the Father, partly because the Spirit has been somewhat marginalized in the lives of many Christians today, certainly in the lives of Christians who are outside the Pentecostal charismatic fold, but even within the Pentecostal community, there is a sense that we believe in the Spirit, we anticipate encountering Him, we anticipate experiencing Him, but I wonder whether we really appreciate just how remarkably comprehensive His agenda is for us. I mentioned in the first service that I had, for much of my early Christian life, two main reasons why I thought the Spirit was involved in my life as a Christian. Number one, I thought the Spirit was there to tell me off. He was the hound from heaven who would chase me down when I had made a mistake. He would catch me and he would give me a good slap because that's what I deserved. He was like a heavenly headmaster. And I had verses from the Bible to support me. Do you remember the verse in Psalm 139 where the writer says, Where can I go from your spirit? 
If I go to the top of the mountains, you'll find me. If I go to the bottom of the ocean, you'll find me. And then the writer continues and he says, and your right hand will... And I knew what the right hand would do. I didn't need to read any more. The right hand would give me a good slap because of what I had done wrong. But of course, you will know that is not what the writer says. He says, and your right hand will support me. Well, no, that was a novelty. I had never been used to the spirit of somebody who was there to support me, somebody who was on my side, someone who was to, to me good. I had thought of the spirit as somewhat of a bit of a disciplinarian. And I needed a bit of discipline, and that's what he was there for. And the fact of the matter is that he does discipline us and chasten us. But that is not the top of his agenda in our lives. And I fear that many Christians have a perspective of the Spirit that is not appropriate because it is too narrow. Sometimes as Pentecostals we simply think he is there to give us a gift. We will mention that in our session three and we'll talk about what are the gifts that the Spirit gives to us and I hope that that will be stimulating for you if not a little surprising when you realize that the agenda of the Spirit is to give all of us gifts, all of us. And in fact he's already given all of you a gift. Oh dear, I didn't know that. I don't know what it is. Well, I'll explore that with you later. But sometimes we view him as somebody who gives gifts and somebody who tells us off. He does both of those things, but that is not the main reason why the Spirit is in our lives today. And I would like to explore that with you in this first session and a little in the second session. But a verse that came to my mind just as we were sitting there enjoying worship, and I have to say I thoroughly enjoyed the worship in the first session, but I enjoyed it in the second session as well. And it's a great platform for us to explore data that's in the text when we spend some time worshipping the Lord, worshipping Jesus and the Father and the Spirit together. And that was a good. So thank you, musicians, for the time you put in to prepare that. I was listening to the bass guitar earlier and I couldn't find him. And uh, I, I thought that um, my guitarist friend here was playing bass and guitar as well. But I, I was looking at his fingers and I realized he couldn't have done it. And then I, then I discovered the bass. The, where has he gone? He's somewhere else, is he? Or maybe he's not. But he was humble there and now he's even more humble because I can't see him at all. <laughs> I was reading a, a verse just as we were coming to the end of our, our worship this morning, and, and you'll know it's in, it's in Ephesians 4, you don't even need to turn to it because I'm only going to be there briefly, but it comes at the end of, an, of a passage where Paul is explaining yet again why the Spirit is present in the lives of Christians. And surprisingly he says, here's why the Spirit is in your life. It is to help you know how much Jesus loves you. That's interesting. The Spirit, he says it in verse uh, uh, 19 of chapter 4, the role of the Spirit in our lives is to help us know how much Christ Jesus loves us. Seems a bit unnecessarily biased in our direction. I've come to help you know just how much you were loved. Now, I don't want this occasion to be a time when we so focus on ourselves as if um, uh, this is all about us. But on the other hand, I do want to spend this time focusing on you because this is all about you. Because that is the perspective of the Spirit. His function, his unilateral declaration is I'm coming into your lives to do many things, but the first thing I want you to know is that you are affirmed by God. That God has taken it upon himself to bring you into his family and much closer to himself than you can imagine or dream of. In fact, it is so close that you wouldn't dare believe it unless somebody came to help you believe it. And the best person who can do that is a member of the Godhead himself. His role is to come into our lives. This, I think, is a timely message to all of us because when we are at our strongest and when everything in life is a a golden horizon, we're still vulnerable, we're still fragile, we're still weak, and there are times when life will ambush us with all kinds of challenges, and we can become even more vulnerable than we were earlier, when the pillars of our life begin to shake because of things that affect us. And it's at those times we can lose sight of who we really are in God. And the role of the Spirit is to whisper 
and sometimes to talk a little louder just how secure we are and just how safe we are and just how loved we are by God and if we lose sight of it he will intentionally come and remind us that's what I'm going to focus on and I'm going to do it by taking a leaf out of the pages of these uh, sacred texts before us the Bible because in the first century when the writers were trying to explore who the Holy Spirit was they had quite a mountain number one they were speaking to people who were not particularly intellectual most Christians at the time couldn't read in fact most people in the world couldn't read most of the Christians came from working-class societies many of them were enslaved so the writers of the New Testament knew that there was a difficulty to explore something as complex as God to people like you and me second challenge was that how can you explain God he is fundamentally inexplicable he is a mystery how can we explain him but they wanted to begin to explain God father son spirit to the people because he is so wonderful was still is so they used metaphors pictures that would help the readers have a better perspective of who the spirit is and we're going to explore some of the metaphors together but let me give you one other reason why they needed to do this carefully the reason was that people who came to faith in Jesus came not from a prior Christian experience they came from pagan worlds and these pagan worlds were dominated by supernatural phenomena certainly the people knew about gods very few people didn't believe in some form of religious activity and the religious activities often were real insofar as there was something happening in their lives as a result of contact with these deities unfortunately the contact was not positive by and large it was always negative but even when there wasn't an experiential contact with these deities there was an assumption that the deities were there the problem is they knew that none of the deities liked you the fundamental basic rule was the gods don't like you they don't care and as I mentioned in the first service there's a word that the people used in the Greco Roman world all nationalities a Greek word that they used to describe the perspective of the gods and the goddesses to people and the Greek word is apatheo and we get our English word apathy from it the gods were apathetic towards people they didn't care whether you lived whether you died they weren't interested in you why should they be you were created you were weak you were vulnerable you had no control over your destinies you were so unlike the gods and the goddesses and they didn't care much about you however if you did something wrong that offended them you could look out because they will send something against you that is negative so your role is to placate the gods so if you're going to your office tomorrow and you are say in the city of Ephesus you would have some things that you would carry in your bag and you would deposit these little gifts to the temples on the way until you had no gifts left and the idea was that you are placating the god for that day you were giving them the opportunity to feel a little good about you so that if there was something that offended them they would not think that it was you that had caused it you were safe <laughs> now the, the the notion therefore is that when you think of the gods or the goddesses in the ancient world you are fearful of them because they have control over you and your lives are somewhat in a, in a uh, vulnerable um, and intimidated because of their power against you so you're scared of them so you placate them now if you're a Jewish person and you are thinking about becoming a Christian you do have a heritage of a God who does you good the pages of the Old Testament are full of it the trouble is for the Jewish people is that their God appears to have left them he hasn't spoken to them for hundreds of years and the assumption is he's either left us because we have been so evil or the superfluous nature of so many gods existing now has just pushed him into the background whatever they don't have a God who cares for them and the writers of the New Testament sharing Christianity are introducing something completely new and that is that this God 
likes you. This God cares for you. How do you know? Because Jesus came to this earth, which no other God would do in a million years. He came to this earth, not just to die on the cross, wonderful though that it was, but he came in order to reveal to you who God was like. You see, if we didn't have Jesus in the pages of the Gospels, all we would have is a picture of God as he's presented in the Old Testament. Isaiah presents a holy God. Amos presents a God of justice and so forth. They're little cameos of God. Jesus comes and says, come and look at me. Wow, you're nothing like we've seen before. Yeah, exactly. More to the point, I am the best representation that you are going to have of God ever. In fact, when you think of Jesus being called the Son of God, be careful, because that is not intended to indicate that Jesus is inferior to God the Father. Sometimes we think it's God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. Spirit, unfortunately, comes third of a list of three. Well, that is completely wrong, as I'll share with you in a moment. But just on this God the Son, the fact that he is called the Son does not mean that he is inferior to the Father. The reason he's called the Son works in a first century setting, and it works in some current African and Asian cultural settings. Here's what I mean. If I couldn't come to you today, who could come as my best representative? Well, now you might think it would be Judy. She has been married to me for 40 years, 41 years this year. She knows me best. She's going to be my best representative. Not in the ancient world. Well, maybe I should send my, my trusted friend, my most trusted colleague, who knows my message and my heart better than me. Maybe he's the one I should send to represent me. It's not going to work in the ancient world. There's only one person who can represent me to be a best reflection of who I am, my heart, my DNA, my, my message. It's going to be my son. There's something about a son in the ancient world that is viewed as being the best reflection, radiation indeed, of the father. So the son is the one who gives the best picture, the best idea of the heart, the core, the content, the message, the DNA of the Father. That's why Jesus is called the Son of God. There's nobody better than Jesus at reflecting who God is. Jesus, best reflection of God. Now, Jesus is no longer with us. He's in heaven. That's not to say he is absent. Of course, he is present with us. And the Spirit is the reflection of his presence. Which brings me now to, let's talk about why the Spirit is here. Because as Jesus reflected the Godhead when he was on this earth, so the Spirit in your life and the Spirit in my life is there to help me appreciate more about God the Father than I could appreciate without his presence. I've already mentioned that the Spirit in me is there to help me know how much God loves me. I've already hinted at the fact that he is there to tell me off from time to time, to gift me from time to time, which we'll talk about later. But I'm coming back to focus on what is the Spirit trying to tell me about God's perspective of who I am right now? However long you've been a Christian, however young you are a Christian, however high you are in the level of spirituality as you perceive yourself, what does God think about you now? Spirit, will you please whisper in my ear because I'll be very interested to know. Well. In answering that question, I need to come back to what I mentioned earlier about some of the metaphors that the writers of the New Testament use when they are wanting to focus on the Spirit. So, for example, the New Testament will associate the concept of fire with the Spirit. Do you remember when John the Baptist speaks about Jesus coming and says, Jesus is going to come and he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire? I think you probably will have touched on this when you looked at the Gospel of Mark and the reference there. Fire is associated with the Spirit. Oil is associated with the Spirit. The day of Pentecost, tongues of fire come upon the heads of the people who were there and a powerful wind comes into the room. Wind that moves you on. Wind is associated with the Spirit. Water is associated with the Spirit. Do you remember that thing that landed on Jesus' head when he was in the River Jordan? The dove. That was meant to be associated with the Spirit. In fact, let's just pause there. 
why was it a dove that landed on the head of Jesus? Why wasn't it a chicken? <laughs> or I guess an ostrich would be a little too difficult for Jesus to balance that on his head, but why a dove? <clears throat> Because it's there for a reason, and like all of these metaphors that the writers use, they are trying to give us opportunities to explore something about the Spirit's involvement in our lives, and using metaphors will help them, because fundamentally, the Spirit is too big for us to accommodate, and our brains would blow up if we tried to. But the Spirit wants us to find out a little bit about Him. So why is it a dove that lands on the head of Jesus? as a symbol of the Spirit. Well, there's been all kinds of suggestions offered, and most of them are very good. But I'm wanting to suggest to you that perhaps one of the most likely reasons as to why God chose that it should be a dove is because the dove lands on Jesus' head, and Jesus is a Jew, and it's in the context of Jewish people. And John the Baptist, who sees the dove landing on Jesus' head, is also a Jew. What does a dove mean to a first century Jew. A first century Jew is going to know his Old Testament and he is going to remember that there was an occasion when a group of people needed rescue, just like the, Isra the Jewish people needed a rescue at the time of Jesus, at the flood. And the dove was sent out by Noah and it came back with the sign, there's new land coming, there's a transformation. Previous birds that were sent out didn't bring that message back, but the dove brought back the message that transformation was occurring. And I'm wondering whether that might be the reason why the dove is chosen by God to be the symbol of the Spirit that comes upon Jesus. Jesus is about to embark on a mission, on a ministry, and the Spirit is going to function with Jesus, and together they're going to achieve that victorious mission. And the first message is, the dove is there to indicate the transformation is going to happen. A new creation is going to happen. A brand new thing is going to happen. Now, the matter of fact is that the Spirit came into your life when you became a Christian. He didn't come ten years later. He's not looking forward to the time when you are worthy enough for Him to be present in your lives. He's already come. He will want to impact you throughout your journey. He will want you to experience Him throughout your walk with God. He will want you to encounter Him once, twice, three times, four times, countless times throughout your journey until you meet Jesus in the next life. But He started to, enter, he started to participate in your journey at the moment you started your walk with Jesus. And if that message that the Spirit comes with Jesus to indicate a transformation, a new start, is valid for Jesus, it's also valid for you as well. When you become a Christian, you start on a journey, and the journey is going to be one of transformation. It's positive. Although, do you remember where Jesus was led by the Spirit, first thing, after he came out of the River Jordan? The wilderness. Oh, I'm not so com comfortable with that Spirit. I'd prefer if you led me to the seaside, or somewhere nice, not the wilderness. But the Spirit takes Jesus to the wilderness. I wonder whether you have wondered why. The fact is that in the ancient world, the Jewish people believed that the wilderness was the place the demons lived in. Uh, and that's why it's quite understandable that that's where the devil meets Jesus. It's kind of his territory. Demons inhabited the wilderness. Now, I'm not saying that that's true, but that's what the ancient Jewish people believed. In fact, do you remember where Jesus talks about somebody who has a, a demonic spirit in them, and the demon goes, and he comes back with seven others? Do you remember where the demon goes in the meantime? It's to a waterless area. Fits in with the worldview of their people. Demons like being where there is no water. Do you remember the demon that was cast out of the Gadarene demoniac? And do you remember the guy, he's there in the tombs, Jesus goes to see him and casts out the demon, in fact there's more than one, there's hundreds of demons, and the demons say, please Jesus, will you send us into the pigs? Do you remember where the pigs go? Into the water. I wonder whether you've ever wondered, why did Jesus let the demons guide him as to what he should do? They tricked him. They went in the pigs, the pigs ran in the water, and the demons were free. 
Do not underestimate the wisdom of Jesus. Jesus is never threatened by demonic advice. He's quite happy to let them think that they are advising him, but the fact of the matter is that they know full well that they are creations and they are in the presence of the creator. At the same time, remember when the devil meets Jesus in the wilderness, never think that these are competing foes and they're almost on the same level as one another. And dear me, it was a tough time for Jesus. But just by the skin of his teeth, he won the battle. Don't think like that. Jesus has been with his father for 40 days. If the devil had any sense, he would have started tempting Jesus on day one, not waited to the end. <laughs> Jesus was at his height of spirituality. Jesus was God. And every temptation that the devil gives to Jesus, Jesus responds to very easily with a verse of scripture. It's that simple. Temptation one, verse of scripture. Temptation two, verse of scripture. Temptation three, the devil gives a verse of scripture. He doesn't quote it quite accurately, but it's a good job. It's a good shot for the devil. And at that point, Jesus says, okay, you shall now no longer tempt the Lord your God. Whoa, the Lord your God. Yes, I am not just an ordinary Jew who happens to wander into your territory. I am the Lord your God. I suspect the devil knew that, but he just needed to be reminded of it. Jesus and the devil are not on a level. One of them is God, the other is a created, defenseless, small d devil. I don't want to underestimate his power, but I don't want us to believe the PR that he would prefer us to believe about himself. Let me just, before I forget, remember those demons that go into the water? Why are they in the water? Because the, Juman, the, the Jews believe that water is the place where demons die. So when the pigs go in the water, the message to the people is, demons dead. Demons don't like water. They live in waterless places. Jesus goes to meet the devil in the wilderness. The Spirit sends him there. I'm not comfortable about where the Spirit might send me. I need to know something about the Spirit to feel safe in that he is in charge of my life. So let's look at one other metaphor. It's the only metaphor we're going to look at. And it's the metaphor of oil. Because oil is used to be associated with the Spirit in the Bible. And if I know that he's in charge of my life, the Spirit, and he truly is, how do I know that he's not going to send me into territory where I'd rather not go? How do I know that he's safe? A safe pair of hands. It's one thing to know that he's in charge, but can I trust him? Um, can I be relaxed with him? Well, I need to remind myself not just how remarkable he is, but how remarkable his commitment is to me and how much more interested is he in me than I am. He is more interested in developing my walk with the Lord than I am. He is more interested in making me feel secure as a Christian that I can possibly dream is possible. That is his commitment to you, to me, so that you feel secure. And to help me appreciate that, the writers need to have some metaphors to focus in on. And I've just mentioned this one about oil. Oil is often associated with the Holy Spirit in the Bible, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And, um, and I need to know why. Well, let's put ourselves in a first century setting and think about what oil means to them. The first thing that you need to remember is that oil in a first century Jewish setting in particular is something that, that does you good. Oil was viewed as being a medical therapy. There was a man um, uh, called Dioscorides who wrote a book 959 cures of oil. It was a little too many that was true, but it was pretty good. But the notion is oil is viewed as medically thera uh, thera a thera a therapy. Oil does you good. Secondly, oil is something that you would want to use when you're wanting to declare that the person that you are anointing with oil is a little bit special. So, if Pastor Jennifer is coming to our house, and before she enters our house, the first thing that Judy will do, if she and she are Jewesses, is that uh, Pastor Jennifer will receive a lot of oil on her. And it won't be a little bit on her forehead, it will flow down her hair and onto her blouse, and she won't be distressed. 
because she knows it's a sign of friendship. It's our way of saying we honor you. It's our way of saying we affirm you. It's our way of saying you are special. Before you come into our home, before we give you any food, we want you to know that you are very special. Oil does you good. Oil is there to say that you are special. And then thirdly, but not exclusively, oil is there to indicate that there has been a transaction that has happened. There was a past and a future. Something has gone, something is to come. In the ancient world, if somebody became married, what would you give to your partner-to-be? You would give them a little gift of oil. In some of our settings, we will give them a ring swap rings but in the ancient Jewish world they would give oil and the oil indicated that there was a past but now there's a future somebody who had been a leper or had some significant skin complaint in the Jewish world that would mean that they were restricted in their relationships in the Jewish community when the skin complaint ended they would go to the priest and the role of the priest was not to function as a doctor but was to check whether the skin complaint had ended and if it had ended then they would be welcomed back into society again but what was that which was needed for that to happen they were anointed with oil and the oil again signified past future a transformation had taken place a slave that had been emancipated was given oil to make the same point now what I'm trying to suggest is that this metaphor of anointing with oil symbolically has a lot of properties that are making powerful statements and that's why it's associated with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit when he comes into your life at salvation he anoints you with himself it's to say I've come to do you good come to do you good well the people in the ancient world did not anticipate that the gods did you good unless you happen to be the emperor or one of a few people most times the gods did not do you good but the writers of the New Testament say yeah but this is a different spirit he's there to do you good and anointing is a, a useful uh, symbol to help you in that regard oil is there to affirm that you are special Oil is there to affirm that somebody is on your side. Do you remember that the name Messiah simply means the anointed one? Mashah, it's from the Hebrew, Mashah. And that again gives the impression that the ordinary person, because the Jewish people do not believe that the Messiah is a member of the Godhead, they believe that he is a person who is anointed by God with some special powers. He's called the anointed one. You are Christians, and that means that from the moment you become a Christian, the Spirit comes in your life, and it's His way of saying, I'm anointing you with myself. What does that mean? It means I've come to do you good. It means I've come to remind you that you are special. Kings, when they were anointed by the prophets, oil was poured on them. When it happened with David, the, the writer Samuel says the Spirit rushed on him. The point is that anointing with oil is associated with the presence of the Spirit. You become a Christian, the Spirit has come in your life. You haven't had to ask Him to come. It's too late if you ask Him to come. He's already come. He's participating in your journey from the start because He is more desirous of giving you opportunities to encounter God than you are to receive them. He is more interested in talking to me and giving me the opportunity to share that with others more than I might dream. That's why I need to keep reminding myself of the significance of these metaphors. Oil is there to do me good, to remind myself that as far as God is concerned, I'm special, and to remind myself that God's on my side. He is, as Jesus describes him, the paraclete, the parakletos, called to be alongside of us. Para alongside Kletos to be called on that day when Jesus was with the disciples and he told them that he was leaving them their hearts would have churned with fear what do you mean you're leaving how can you go and he's already told them that they're going to do more than he did and now you're telling me you're going how on earth can we do that it's because another comforter is coming another 
counselor is coming, another advocate is coming, and he will walk with the disciples even closer than Jesus, because Jesus can only be in one place at a time, whereas the Spirit can be in many places at the same time. And his commitment to you is the same to me, is the same to Jesus. This is a truly remarkable spirit. I've done again. I can't remember what time I started. Oh, it's very gracious of you. <laughs> I'm going to take you to one verse together. And I'm going to take you to Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. If we had time, we could look at other metaphors of the Spirit. And it will be interesting the, the statements that they are making. But we're going to focus on this verse because it will particularly relate to what I want us to be taking with us into the rest of our day together. This is Paul speaking to the churches of Galatia, which is in the southern part of modern-day Turkey. A mongrel group of people, uh, very racially mixed, uh, quite difficult to govern as far as the politicians of the day were concerned, and they've come to be Christians. They bring a lot of baggage with them, uh, emotional and uh, lifestyle baggage and they've come together and Paul having established a number of churches there writes to them this letter and when he gets to chapter 4 having reminded them that in Jesus they are one family when he gets to chapter 4 he speaks about the significance of the spirit in their lives and we'll see how it m merges in with this metaphor of the spirit being like oil that does us good this is what he says in chapter 4, verse 6. Because you are sons and daughters, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. In other words, in one little verse, Paul has encapsulated the reason why the Spirit has come into the lives of those Christians. It's not the only reason why the Spirit has come into their lives, but it is a major reason. In the book of Galatians, Paul doesn't talk about the fact that the Spirit has come to give gifts to Christians. He doesn't talk about the fact that the Spirit has come to transform us, to chastise us from time to time when we're not quite getting it right. But what he does in this verse tell us what is of major importance to Paul and to his readers as to why the Spirit is in their lives. And it is something that too many Pentecostals have lost sight of. We think of the Spirit as being somewhat utilitarian in our lives and we forget that his major agenda is to remind us that encounter between God and us is of central importance to God. Because God actually, although we sing it, he actually does love us and he loves it and he, he loves us and wants to manifest that love for us in many different ways. And here's the undergirding truth of that mentioned by Paul. Because you are children of God, because you are sons, God has done something. So that's the basis. Because you're a Christian, because you are a follower of Jesus, because he has now said you're a son or a daughter of mine, I'm going to do something. In fact, he does it before we realize it. He sends his spirit. That's the first thing he does, which indicates that we have not have had to ask the spirit to come. God has sent him. We have not had to invite the Spirit to come. We have not had to pray for the Spirit to come, let alone plead for the Spirit to come. The Spirit has come because God has already sent him. And don't think for one minute that the Spirit didn't want to go. Don't think that in heaven they're having some kind of dialogue and somebody has to go with these Christians and Jesus says, well, I'm not going. I've been there 33 years. I was quite enough for me. And the Father says, well, I can't go because obviously I'm the Father and I'm too important. So Spirit, you're the only one left you're going to have to go. The Spirit is not the divine servant. The Spirit goes, and wherever the Spirit goes, the Father goes. And wherever the Father goes, the Son goes. They are indivisible. I don't understand what I'm talking about, but that's the nature of the Trinity. And do not try and understand the Trinity. I've given up trying to understand the Trinity. In fact, I'm not convinced that I was ever intended to understand the Trinity. And if you read the New Testament, we are not given guidance as to how to understand the Trinity. Paul, when he talks about Jesus and he says that Jesus is God, was so unnerving for Jewish Christians. What do you mean Jesus is God? Jehovah's God. And Paul says, well, actually, Jesus is God as well. 
He doesn't defend it. He doesn't explain it. He just says, that's it. A little bit later, he's going to say, and the Spirit is God as well. Good grief. <laughs> We're not intended to understand the Godhead, but we are intended to explore the beauty of the Godhead and to explore relationship with each of the members of the Godhead. God has sent the Spirit. It's, he's got a divine backing, and the Spirit says, excellent, I'm happy to go. Why am I happy yet to go? Because I am going to be the one who's giving the opportunity for us people and the Godhead to have a relationship. And if I can be the bridge, then that's excellent. Well, Paul says that's exactly what's happened. The Spirit has been sent. And just one thing you need to know, because sometimes our English translations don't present this as clearly as the writer would have intended, Paul uses a special past tense when he says that God has, that God has sent the Spirit. In Greek, it's possible to use the past tense in a couple of different ways. One of them would be to use the past tense to be an ongoing activity, such as, I was coming to church this morning. Took a little time. Or you can use the past tense in a punctilia way, which is a, a moment of time. Jesus died on the cross. The process of dying took a little time, but whenever the writers of the New Testament say Jesus died on the cross, they always use the aorist tense, he was dead. It wasn't a fiction, it wasn't a symbol, he was dead. And here, the writer similarly says God has sent the Spirit. It's not that God is in the process of sending the Spirit, or that God has sent the Spirit and he's in the process of coming. No, he's come, he's been sent, it's happened. It's been an instantaneous transfer from heaven, so to speak, whatever that is, into your life, wherever you happen to be. He is in residence. Don't get too bothered about where is he? Is he in my head, my heart? Is he in my leg, my arm? What if I'm a big person? Does that give him a bit more room? Or if I'm a small person, is he a bit squashed? Or is it that he's there or there? I'm not too sure where the spirit is. In fact, the writers of the New Testament say that we are in the Spirit, and then they say the Spirit is in us. And I'm thinking, well, hang on, it can't be both. Well, they say, yes, you're in Jesus, and Jesus is in you. No, 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 which is it? Am I in Jesus, or is Jesus in me? And I think Paul would slap me here because I'm trying to understand this mystery of the proximity of the God to us. The writers are trying to say is, you cannot be closer to God than you currently are, not even a billion years time. When you're in the presence of God in heaven, you won't be closer to God than right now. Surely that can't be the case. Well, it is the case. Because God's commitment to us now means that we are inextricably linked with him now. We will experience it more then because there won't be sin in the way. But it is currently the case. Wow. God has sent the Spirit and he is in my life now. Your life now. Wow. Ah, but he doesn't say he sent the Spirit. He says... He sent the spirit of his son. It's the only time the writer uses this phrase. In fact, it's the only time this phrase is used in the New Testament. The spirit of his son. And I suspect what the writer is trying to do to this mongrelized group of Christians is to say, listen, nobody wants you. Nobody wants to govern you because you are so uncom un ungovernable. You come from all kinds of societies. You're completely mixed up racially. You don't have much of a heritage. Let me tell you the spirit who's in you. He's the spirit who is associated with who? The son of God, Jesus. The son of the God who created the universe. That spirit has chosen to come and live with you. Gracious me, I don't even know my ancestry. I don't even know my parents. And are you telling me that the spirit of sonship of God has come to dwell in me? Paul says, that's exactly it. You've not got a second-rate spirit. He's not an inferior spirit. He's definitely not the third member of the Trinity. It's the spirit who walked with Jesus. And Jesus was worthy of the presence of the spirit because the spirit knew that he was God. And so the spirit conjoins himself with him. That same spirit has come to dwell in you. <laughs> but I, I haven't got much education. I certainly haven't got much money. I've only been a Christian for three seconds. And you telling me that the Spirit has decided he's going to come and live with me. Yep, that's exactly what I'm saying. Well, what kind of Spirit? Is he one of the lower order of the angels? Well, no, he's not even an angel. He's the same Spirit of God who happened to walk with Jesus was when he was on this earth. That's the same Spirit. Good grief. Can't believe it. Well, that's tough. It's the truth. And why is he there? 
Well, before we find out why is he there, let's just notice what Paul says as to where he is. Because Paul says he's in your heart. The spirit is in my heart. Oh, there I go. I wasn't too sure if it was my leg or my arm, but now I know he's in my heart. Not much room for him, but that's where he is, so that's where he is. That's fine. But why does he say that the spirit has been sent into our hearts? Why not just into our lives? Why not just say into us? It's because the heart means something in a first century setting. The heart is, well, what is it? If you were going to say, I love you with all my heart, that would be completely understandable in a 21st setting. I love Judy with all my heart. She understands what I mean. But if I was in a first century setting and I wanted to express that kind of affection to my wife or to my children, I wouldn't say, I love you with all my heart because they wouldn't understand what I was talking about. I would have to say, I love you with all my bowels. <laughs> I love you with all my intestines. That's where the message comes through. Ah, Judy would say, thank you so much. Now I know that you care for me because your bowels are being moved whenever you think about me. I'm so pleased. Thank you so much. Tell me it again. I love you with all my bowels. <laughs> Pastor René has now remembered some things to put on his next card to his wife, Brigitte. <laughs> so, what does the heart mean then? Because if the heart is not the place of romance and affection in the ancient world, what is it the place of? And in the ancient world, the heart is used to refer to the center of a person's being. It's the very heart of a person, the core of their being. It's where they make decisions. It's their DNA. It's the real center. Perhaps we might say in a 21st century setting, it's our mind would be where we make our decisions. In the ancient world, the heart has that capacity. So Paul says, when he says the spirit comes into our hearts, he's trying to say the spirit comes into the very center of our being. There cannot be anything closer to me than my heart. That's the picture. And so the spirit comes there. Now, if the spirit was over there by the drum kit and he said, I'm going to stay there all your life, I'd be saying, dear to me, that's too close. I don't deserve that. You know, a mile away would be quite happy. If you saw me from a distance and looked in my direction once in a blue moon, I would be more than pleased. But the spirit says, no, no, I'm coming a lot closer than that. I'm coming into the very center of who you are. Oh, I'm not ready yet. Let me tidy myself up. Listen, you'll never be ready for me because I'm perfect. I'm coming in anyway and I'm going to do a job of transforming you whilst I'm with you from inside. But that's not why I'm there fundamentally. This is why I'm there fundamentally. I'm there to help you know that it's okay to say to God who happened to create the universe, Father. Now we've got used to the fact that it's okay for us to call God Father because we're Christians. But Paul is speaking to people who are nervous about speaking about God at all or speaking to God at all, let alone identifying him in a prayer. And if they do, they will do it rather nervously. And Paul says, no, no, it's okay. You can tiptoe in this direction if you want. But on the other hand, you can be completely confident God is not just your God. He is not just your creator. He is your father. And my role, says the Spirit, is help you believe it. Is help you remember it. Remember, it's the Spirit of his Son who's come into your life. The Spirit who is associated with the Son of the Father, that same Spirit comes into your life, daughter, my life, son and he says i'm here to help you realize that you truly are a son and daughter not servant let alone slave son and daughter of father wow that's remarkable of course it's remarkable but then the spirit is remarkable he's remarkable intrinsically because he's a member of the godhead but as far as we are concerned he is remarkable because his vocation is to remind us that god's perspective of us is that we also are remarkable so remarkable that he has destined us not for this life but for eternity and he wants us to begin to appreciate the value that he has placed on us we won't believe it. We can't believe it. It's too good to be true. And so God says, okay, you need help. Spirit, go help them. Before the Spirit goes, he's gone. Because he wants to participate in helping us realize just how safe and secure and loved we are. I nearly said honored. We are by God. 
These are terms that are seemingly too high to use of God's affection towards us, but they are true. Sometimes I'm a little nervous that if I speak like this, I'll get blasé about my sin. I'll become indifferent to my sinfulness, and therefore I'll back off enjoying the status I have as a Christian. I have to learn that this is God's perspective of me. My role is to respond to it by saying, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. My response is to say, I want to worship you. And out of my worship, I want to somehow live up to the status that you have called me to, even though I never will do it, but I want to be moving in that direction. But at the end of the day, we will never have lived up to it, but God knows that, and he still gives himself to us completely because this is a statement about him more than a statement about us. He is a unique God who loves and does good to ordinary people like you and me. Our response is to say, I can't believe it. This is too good to be true. And most things that are too good to be true aren't true. But salvation is just wonderful. Amen. And you've ended the sermon for me. So let me just thank God on behalf of us all. Father, thank you that we are in the presence of a good God. And that word is so inadequate to, to describe the remarkable nature of your goodness. And yet, practically, what's more remarkable is that you have chosen to allow us to enjoy the goodness that defines you and you've allowed us to enjoy it practically thank you so much thank you jesus for being our savior thank you spirit for being our teacher for being present in our lives and our response is to say sorry for those times when we have not realized just how much you love us and please help us to worship you back for who you are thank you Amen.